Architecture, Space, Motion, and Technology. When we consider architecture, what are we really studying? How does one define architecture? When we look at something like Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris, it is clearly architecture. It is a structure. We enter it, move through it. When we are looking at an object like Stonehenge, more questions arise. Can we really enter Stonehenge? When are we inside? What makes it architecture? Architecture can be defined as an object which controls both the experience of space and our movement through space. Therefore, even objects like the Mauryan pillars of India can be considered architecture, not just sculpture. And monuments like the Ziggurat of Ur can be more thoroughly understood as architecture, even though they have no interior spaces. To give you a clearer sense of architecture in terms of space, motion, and technology, let's examine the Parthenon. The Parthenon is the largest of several temples atop the Acropolis of Athens, Greece. It is the core of several important ancient rituals, including the fam famous Pan-Athenaic procession, the procession of all Athens to present a new garment to Athena. Let us consider the Parthenon in terms of space, motion, and technology. The space of the Parthenon is uniquely divided, as the Parthenon itself is actually two temples, not one, an Ionic temple set inside a Doric temple. The ornamentation of the temple clearly marks its space by forming a specific program. The outer Doric temple shows important battles of order against chaos, the gods versus the giants, the Greeks against the Amazons, the Lapiths against the Centaurs, and the Trojan War. So the perimeter of the temple itself is this epic ordering of the cosmos. In the pediments, we see important scenes relating to Athena, her birth, and her claim on Athens, her victory over Poseidon. At this point, we enter the world of Athena and her sacred space. We cross the threshold of the Doric perimeter and into the more elegant Ionic temple and its unique decoration, the great frieze of the Pan-Athenaic procession. Never before had contemporary mortals been depicted upon a temple. The Trojan War was already mythic history, which included the actions of deities. Here we have a frieze where ordinary people, not great heroes or warriors, are shown in an activity well known to the Athenian people. Here, Athenians are placed within the mythic and divine world. These sculpted figures walk through Athens to the great temple, just as we would have done to view the sculptures. Finally, a door separates us from the interior of the temple. As devotees, we would have stopped here on the porch. The priest would have taken our offering to the goddess, who could be seen within, looking out upon us. Thus, the space is divided between the mundane world and worlds of increasing sanctity towards the inner home of the goddess herself. Our discussion of space has also touched on movement. Indeed, these two elements are inevitably linked. The Parthenon dominates space and draws us toward it by its sheer size and its location. We then move through layers of space to the inner core, where we experience the divine. The building itself is just one part of our experience. The control of movement actually begins far from the structure itself, at the outskirts of Athens, with the starting point of the Pan-Athenaic procession. The processional path winds up through the ancient city, up to the Acropolis, and to the temple complex. When we reach the temple, we move through the layers of space marked by the plinths and porches to the presence of the goddess. This layering of space was very common in Western religious structures. So what technology has been employed and to what effect? When we see the Parthenon, we see a building of meticulous perfection. The straight walls and columns, the perfect proportions, the gleaming whiteness. However, the Parthenon is more than meets the eye. Let's start with the gleaming whiteness. Remember the most ancient sculpture in architecture was painted. The use of gleaming white marble, a particularly expensive building material, was intended to impress, but it was not left stark white. In fact, it's likely that the metopes, pediments, and friezes, and perhaps even the columns and moldings, were brightly painted. Painting this expensive material was a further sign of opulence. And what of those straight walls and columns? Have you ever been to a city with tall buildings and looked up? 
Don't the buildings seem to lean in towards you? This is an optical illusion caused by the curve of our eyes. With the massive size of the Parthenon, why doesn't it seem to lean too? The answer lies in the construction. When one actually measures the Parthenon, there is a slight swell and curve to the surfaces, sometimes as much as six inches. This swell compensates for your eye, and thus makes the temple look perfectly straight. The prized proportions are also a result of technology. Greek scholars had devised the idea of the golden mean, x equals 2y plus 1. Using this formula, the architects and masons of the Parthenon were able to execute a, a structure with specific proportionality that the Greeks, and we as their successors and cultural heirs, found pleasing. Thus the temple was made to look perfect, and therefore suitable for its purpose, to house the goddess. By contemplating how the Parthenon controls space, influences motion, and evokes technology, we have a clearer understanding of the structure and its purpose in the ancient world.